school, school system. I graduated from Holyoke Catholic. I've been researching my family history for 23 years, and I've got Irish roots. I've managed to track them back to the original towns in Ireland. I've tracked some of them into New Zealand, and I've tracked them all here into the U.S. My French-Canadian uh, lines, I've been able to track all of my French-Canadian lines to the original families of New France, and we'll talk about that, and to the original towns that they came from in France in the uh, 1600s. I've also got Lithuanian roots, but I don't speak nor do I read Lithuanian, so um, I'm not as successful with that as I have been with other topics. Um, so why am I doing this? Eileen already told you. She asked if I would uh, share what I've learned while researching my family. So with that, I'm going to use a case study <clears throat> to demonstrate how you can how you can use this methodology to trace your families all the way back to France. Now, some of the pitfalls that we'll talk about are uh, the French language. I use Google uh, Translator. Uh, all of these are hyperlinked in the presentation, so you'll have those. But you can go in and uh, uh, access the translator in Google, but also you can, act, you can access a translator in uh, Google Chrome, which is what I use for my, um, for my browser. And the websites that I'll show you in Canada also have an English version to the website that you can select. Another pitfall is these records are written in cursive. Uh, there's a lot of spelling errors. They were written, uh, spelled differently in the 1600s than they are today. Uh, penmanship wasn't what it was uh, uh, back then, so so it's very difficult to read some of these records. Uh, there are some uh, basic words like numbers, months, birth, death, marriage. Uh, I've provided a list of those uh, in the back in the appendix. I've also provided a link to a website uh, with familysearch.org that has an extensive listing of French and English words, so the translations. So don't always use the exact name, and you're going to see that as we move forward. Uh, the names change. Uh, back in the 1840s in the United States, when my relatives came into upstate New York, a lot of the census takers uh, were not great at spelling, and you'll see that as we move forward. The deep names in Canada are uh, also known as names. So there are some of these you will see that they have a deep name, and we're going to get to that when I show you my uh, my eighth uh, uh, great-grandfather, and we get to that. Some more pitfalls, family lore. So you're gonna see that come out in spades when we, when we start this, this journey. Uh, people think that because they had a, a, a beautiful sounding name that they were, they were literate. Well, back in the 1840s, we didn't have a big school system. It wasn't compulsory, so not everybody was literate. Everybody thinks that their family was rich or they came from royalty. You'll see that in my family, and, and none of it's true. Uh, some of the helpful points, the Catholic Church in Canada kept remarkable records for birth, marriage, and death. Uh, the other thing about this is that in French-Canadian culture, the wife always retains her maiden name, even after marriage. And you'll see that with regards to my second great-grandmother when she remarries. She remarries under her maiden name. Uh, and these can be really helpful with birth, marriage, death records, and you'll see that when we get into uh, uh, my ninth, my eighth great grandmother. Okay, all of the sources that I've amassed, I put into the appendix. If there's a website, uh, they are uh, typically hyperlinked. They also will have an asterisk near them if they are uh, subscription based. I also list some of the books uh, that I've used that are for both US and Canada sources. And now let's get into the case study. I'm going to look at my Hamill, Bailey, and Perone line. Uh, we're going to take a look at my known ancestors when I started on this journey 23 years ago. <clears throat> we're going to take a look at the, the Hamill legend, the family lore, and we're going to use some census and church records here in the States. I'm going to show you uh, Father Tangway's dictionary, uh, genealogical dictionary of French Canadian families. Uh, that is at the Hoyle Public Library in a PDF. Eileen's also got um, some hyperlinks for those as well, all seven volumes. And I was able to find a translation uh, or an English translation to show you how to use the, uh, the dictionary. So that's also available at the library. My good friend Dave Ruzick, who's uh, 
who's chimed in today uh, is uh, supported me on this research by using the uh, genealogy of the Hamill family, published by the Hamill Family Society. Uh, I did use that. It didn't. It did not help, but it also got me uh, vectored onto a different, a different uh, family line. We're going to talk about two websites uh, that I use in Canada, and you'll notice that some of these also have uh, uh, links in Ancestry.com. I like these two websites better than Ancestry because the uh, the images are clearer. I'm able to have a, a better luck reading cursive French from the 1600s with these two sites than I am using Ancestry. Now, both of these are, uh, are subscription, and we'll talk about that as we, as we get to those sites. <clears throat> um, and then yeah, I use Google. I use Google to find family societies. I found my eighth cousin by doing this. And I also use Google to find more ancestors. So when you get this far back, and we're talking about the original families of New France, and, and that's what these are if you can get back far enough. This is like researching Mayflower descendants. There were not a lot of people alive then. You can Google these names. One name that I Googled was my ninth great grandmother's first husband. And I found out that he died in a raid on an Iroquois village in Mon on the island of Montreal. And, and it's all well documented. So when you get back that far, these, these, are, these names are very, very well documented in, in French Canadian uh, history. So what I knew starting out, <clears throat> all of my French Canadian lines are on my mother's side of the family. My grandmother was Florence Veronica Hamill. And her parents were Antoine, also known as Anthony Hamill and Marie Louise Picard. That was all I knew going into this in 1997 when I first started out. So what I did was I immediately ordered documentation on my great grandfather, Anthony Hamill. I got his marriage certificate from, uh, at the time, I believe it was Susan Egan was a city clerk in Holyoke and I found his obituary. So by his marriage certificate, I get his parents' names, Anthony and Adeline. And that's all it says is Adeline down here in the corner. Now, there is a book that is available at the Hoya Public Library by Rita Shane, and it's the Precious Blood Marriages. And they, she's compiled all of them, I believe, up through 1890. And I use that to go in and find uh, Adeline's maiden name, Bailey. You'll see that as we get a little closer. My great grandfather was born in New York State. I also found his obituary, which gives us his age at the time of his death, and that led me to a birth date of about 1858. And it also gave a birthplace of Ossible Forks, New York, right through here. Now, it's pronounced Ossible in upstate New York. It is not pronounced Osable. Uh, and I, I have personally been there. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So that gave me an opportunity to start looking at more names. So now I had Antoine and Adeline, but I didn't know anything about them. <clears throat> so let's go exploring through my, my family history. We're gonna talk about what my family knew. And this is all in the Hamill legend. Then we're gonna use census and birth, marriage and death records in the States. We'll go to, the, we'll go to Canada and we're gonna take a look at a few books that I used as well. Okay, so the Hamill legend. In 1987, uh, Oria Hamill-Ayat uh, started transcribing her family legend as told to her by her cousin, Marie Dauphiné. And she started taking notes on this in 1910 when she was all of 15 years old. And that's, the legend goes that my third great-grandfather, Anthony Antoine Mac Hamill, immigrated from Scotland dirt or England during the reign of Queen Victoria. He built a lumber mill with his two brothers in New Brunswick, and somehow he fell out of favor with the British government in Canada and he didn't pay his taxes. So he fled to Ossible Forks, New York, where he bought a farm. He was married to Marie Perron. He dropped Mac from his name, and he had three children that I always refer to as Bill, Phil, and Tony. And uh, he periodically left the farm for days at a time, and he returned with stacks of money 
He was so wealthy, he would light cigars with $5 bills, and he bought farms for all of his sons. So right away, there's, there's a red herring there. We're all, I'm suspicious immediately that he was that wealthy. So my second great-grandfather is, is Ant, Antoine Jr. He apparently didn't like farming, so he, he, he blew out of the Adirondacks and moved down to Chicopee, where he died in 1873. Adele remarried to Octave Gamache two years later. And Oria's brother Roy stated that the Hamels had left France and settled in England where they added Mac to the name. And several, it took them several years to get to Canada. Now Oria believed that there were lumber mills still in New Brunswick, which there very well could be because if you look at New Brunswick, it's about 43% forested. So she also said that there was a Hamelsville in New Brunswick. So the wrap up, I now have some more names. I've got my third great grandparents. I've got my third times great uncles, Guillaume and Philippe. My second great grandparents with a host of children that she also names in the, um, in the legend. And I've got some potential geographic locations that I wanna take a look at. I've also got some potential occupations. He's a lumber mill owner and, and operator and he was a farmer. So with that, we're going to go into U.S. Census records. Right off, there is no town named Ossible Forks in New York. I found that out because I couldn't find census records for anything. So I contacted the New York State Archives and they suggested that I look at Clinton and Essex counties because what Ossible Forks is, it's, it's kind of like the highlands in Holyoke. It's just a geographic area. It's not a town. Um, and, it, and it borders both counties. So I started checking Clinton County for 1840 and 1850. Um, state censuses don't exist at the person level in New York State for the time frame I was interested in. So I went right into the um, federal censuses. Searching on 1850, I had no luck finding Antoine Hamill. But at searching on Antoine, I got a hit. So none of the families show up in the 1840 census. So that tells me that they immigrated sometime after the census was taken in 1840. So I found two consecutive pages in the, in the 1850 census, one for Dominic Hamill, spelled A-M-M-E-L, and his family. I also found, and they were all living in Blackbrook, New York which is in Clinton County. I also found Francis Bailey, Francois, Felix Hamel, Amel, A-M-M-E-L, and Antoine, A-M-M-E-L. Now, why is it spelled A-M-M-E-L? H is silent in French. And if my high school French teacher had ever found out that I didn't even consider that going forward, I think she, she'd be turning over in her grave right now. But notice that they are living very close to my great-great-grandfather's in-laws, my third great-grandparents, Francois and Marie Bailey. And it's also spelled B-A-I-L-E-Y, which is the American version. So as I said, H is silent in French. Bailey in French is spelled B-E-L-L-A-Y. Now, there are a lot of Amel, A-M-E-L-L -L families in Blackbrook. And I know that because when I went up to Blackbrook, the historian I work with tried to get them to come and meet with me at a town hall. And they said, no, there's absolutely no relationship. I came back to Maryland. And three months later, I got the results of my ancestry DNA test. And I am a relation to every single one of them. So I don't know if I'll ever get back up there to meet them. So the next steps confirm Antoine's death confirm Adele's second marriage, and then get in the car and go to Blackbrook. So Antoine died in 1873, but he didn't die in Chicopee. He died in Holyoke. He's right here. He died of smallpox. It does not list where he was born or his parents. Adele, in fact, did marry Octave Gamache, and notice she uses her maiden name. So she kept the French Canadian tradition. 
and it also verifies her parents as well. She died in 1894 in Holyoke, and she's buried in Chicopee with Antoine. <clears throat> so as I said, I got into the car and I drove up to Black Brook in July of 2012. It just so happened that a very good friend of mine had uh, grown up in Redford, and she loaned me the use of her grandfather's house on the Saranac River. So I was literally seven miles from downtown Black Brook when I was there. I hired a local historian who literally worked for meals. All she wanted to do was just take me wherever I wanted to go, and I bought her lunch and bought her dinner. So Antoine petitioned for naturalization in October of 1858, and this is his naturalization paperwork right here. So note the spelling of the name, La Mille, L-A-M-I-L-L-E. Note that he was illiterate. He could not write. He made his mark. So now I know that. I had a cousin who told me there's no way he could have been illiterate with such a beautiful sounding name as Antoine, but it's true. He was naturalized on the 18th of October, and this LaMille also shows up in the 1860 census in Chicopee. He also owned land, and he sold it on 24 March 1869 prior to moving to Massachusetts. Again, on this document, it has the last name spelled A-M-E-L-L, -L, and it has both his mark and his wife's mark. So neither of them were literate. One thing she also did was she took me down a country road where there's a one room schoolhouse that was attended by my great grandfather and all of his siblings. And that one room schoolhouse is now in somebody's backyard. You can see their house behind it. And at the time, eight years ago, their daughters were playing house in the schoolhouse that my great grandparents, my, my great grandfather went to. Okay, so now let's dispel the Hamill legend. So Antoine Sr. was not found in Blackbrook. So I, I can't prove Marie Perrone was his wife. Dominique was born in Quebec province. So I think it's safe to say that his brother Antoine was as well. Dominic was um, my second great grandfather's uncle. And that was verified by uh, Marie Daly at the New England Historic and Genealogical Society in Boston. And so he probably immigrated into upstate New York after the 1835, 1837 uprisings in Quebec province when the French Canadians tried to overthrow British rule. There were a lot of French Canadians who left within the next five to eight years afterwards. So Antoine Jr. was definitely his nephew. Um, they didn't immigrate from New Brunswick. The Hamels are some of the original families of New France. They're, they're pioneers of New France. And I'll show you that they immigrated, um, the two brothers immigrated in the, 18, in the 1600s. Now there was no lumber mill in New Brunswick and there is no Hamelsville, New Brunswick either. A quick Google Maps search and a Google search proved that. So I'm gonna take you very quickly, we're gonna go over to the PRDH website and I'm gonna show you the pioneers So you get to the pioneers and you can scroll down. This translates automatically into English for you. On, uh, I've selected English on the PRDH website. You scroll down and it tells you who they are. Now, one thing you can do is you type in a family name. So we're gonna type in Hamill. And it comes up with five. Now these first three are my Hamill family. Charles and John immigrated together. They were brothers. And this John is the son of, the, uh, of John Hamill. And now we'll go back to presentation. So that's, that's how you get into the PRDH. And you can take a look and you can see, you can type in any name and we'll go back and we'll, we'll have some fun after the presentation and we'll type in some names to see what we get. But you can type in any name, and if they were part of the original pioneers of New France, you'll find them. Okay, so from the 1850 census and death records, I now have 
Adele Bailey's family. So I'm going to concentrate on Adele's family because we could not find anything in the, as Dave uh, likes to refer to it, the Book of Hamill. Uh, we could not find anything about Antoine and his brothers, uh, uh, Dominique, or a Guillaume or a Philippe. So we're going to concentrate on Adele. We know that Francois and Marie were probably married in Canada. We know that from the 1850 census because Adele was born in 1832 in Canada. However, two of them were born in New York. They were eight years old at the time. So I think it's safe to say that the Bailey family immigrated between 1840 and 1842. So now it's time to go off to the Canadian records. So as I said, I use two online sources. Genealogy Quebec has access to the Druin Institute, among other databases. It's, um, I think, a reasonable subscription. It's about $100 a year Canadian, or if you want to do it on a monthly basis, it's $13 a month. There are institution subscriptions available. Uh, the PRDH um, has access to uh, the Pioneers and the Daughters of the King. Now, the Daughters of the King were the um, female version of uh, Pioneers. They, they, uh, they were not settling New France as fast as the British were settling the 13 colonies. And the British were sending families over at, at a time. The French were sending soldiers, they were sending trappers, and they were sending uh, shipping companies to ship the furs back to France. So they weren't populating New France and the king was getting a little anxious about that. So he took it upon himself to pay the voyages of many women who were known as the Les Filles de Roi and they, um, they were vetted. They were not women that they just took off the streets and said, you're, you're going to Quebec. These were women that wanted to go. They, were, they got off the boat. They picked their own husband. Many of them became farmers' wives. Many of them became trappers' wives. And many of them became business owners in, uh, in Quebec and Montreal. And then I'm going to show you uh, one published source that I use, and that's Tangway's uh, uh, collection. Okay, so when you go into uh, Genealogy Quebec, this is what the, the page looks like. And you're able to search on an individual, you're able to search on a couple, and if you know the parish what they're born in, you're able to search on the parish. Now, I'm going to show you what these records look like. I, I typically will search on individual or couple, and we'll show you how I did that for both of them. And they have birth, marriages, and deaths, and you can see the dates that they're all good for up here. They're always adding more records to Genealogy Quebec. So I'm on their mailing list. Every time they upload a new tranche, I get, I get an email telling me to go in and take a look at things. They've got newspaper articles, they've got postcards, they've got photos, they've got an awful lot on their database. Okay, so I went in and I'm gonna do an individual search and we're gonna search on Adeline. Now, I spelled it the English way, D-A-I-L-E-Y with no luck. So I went and I typed in B-E-L-L-A-Y. I know she was born, according to the census, 1832, but we never trust the census. So I'm going to go with 1825 to 1835. She is going to be the subject that I'm looking for, and I'm looking for her baptism. And this is what comes back. If you click on the parish, it will take you to a parish map of Quebec province, and it will show you where La Maldai is located. This gives you her baptism date on the top and her birth date. Many times they were baptized the same day. If you click on this link, you go to the original record in cursive French. If you click on this, it will take you into uh, her family, the PRDH. It'll show you everything that PRDH has for her. But notice her mother's name, Marie Perron. So Marie Perron was definitely my third great grandmother. She was just not married to Antoine Hamill. And any Hamill tree online, especially from the Holyoke area, uses the Hamill legend. And every single tree lists Marie um, Perron as being Antoine Hamill's wife when she wasn't. 
So when I click on the PRDH, this is what it call it, it brings up for me. I did this for, for uh, my third great grandfather, Francois. It lists his parents and that's more family members. It lists his birth and baptism dates, where he was and where he was baptized, the location, where he was married and when. If you click on the hyperlink, you'll get his marriage records. It lists his, his wife's name and it lists her family. When you click on family, and we're going to click on, we're going to look at that. I'm going to take you to the Bailey family. Um, you'll you'll see the entire family that that Francois and Marie had, that they know about in France. Many times, if they're born in the U.S., the French have no knowledge of them, and and we'll talk about that when I get into uh, my final slides. But also notice that there's several different kinds of spellings here, and this is a deep name, Labelle. So if I put Bailey and Labelle into the search. I would get this record. So this is what happens when you select uh, the family and you get a list of everybody. And you come down here and there's Marie and Francois. This is Francois's family. Up top, it lists his father, Antoine Perron. I'm sorry, her father, Antoine Perron, and her mother. And it lists her her parents' parents, and when they were married and where they were married. So each of these are hyperlinked. Now I'm gonna just, I'm gonna take you on a, a fast trip because what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna be clicking down the road on Antoine Perron, and it's gonna take me back several generations. I just click on the father, continue to click on the father, and it takes me back. So now I know this, Francois was born in 1798, Marie Perron about 1810. Note um, the difference in age between my, my second great grandfather and, and second great grandmother. So by um, 21 years difference. Okay, so as I take that highway trip down, this takes us all the way down to my eighth great grandparents, Daniel Francois Perron Swier and Louise Gargotin. Those are my eighth great grandparents, but it also lists my ninth great grandparents. Also take a look, Daniel was born out of wedlock. He was also an immigrant. So when I search on Daniel, by, when it says immigrant, Daniel was a, um, a pioneer. He was one of the original founders of New France. Also note, where he was born and when he was baptized, same day, but he was baptized in a Calvinist temple in La Rochelle, France. I now know the town he came from in France, but he's not Catholic. That becomes a problem for him. We also get uh, his burial date and where he was buried in the guardian angel uh, cemetery and also, this little piece of French down at the bottom translates to, if you want to know more about where he came from and the circumstances of his birth, then the Society of French Canadian Genealogy published an article about him in their winter 1988 um, issue. And you can order that uh, via, via library loan as well. Um, Louise is also one of the Fille du Roi. So we're gonna we're just gonna click on that very very quickly. I'll take you into that. Okay, so this is what the Fedora page looks like. Again, it has been translated into English. It, this was all again done by the PRDH website, but it lists every single one of them by last name, their PRDH number. Everybody has a PRDH number that they use to catalog them when they got married and their spouse's first and last name. So this is a listing of all of the names that they have in their database who were daughters of the king. And I put this into an Excel spreadsheet, converted it to a PDF, and the library has that in, Hol in Holyoke. So now we're gonna go back. Okay, so that shows you the pioneers and the daughters of the king. And now we're gonna do a little bit more work on Daniel. So 
looking for a transcribed marriage record for him, I went back in into Genealogy Quebec. I did a search on the two of them, Daniel and Louise. The original document, again, in cursive, where they were married. It lists the three, the three witnesses that were there, as well as the name of the priest, Thomas Morell, and where the priest lived. This is the original paperwork for Daniel Perrone, married on 26 February 18, in 1664. And again, if you list, uh, 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 make a list of the of French words you're looking for, it will take, you'll be able to translate these fairly easily. This is much clearer for me than using the paperwork that was on uh, Ancestry. So that's why for me, it's worth paying a little extra money to get the PRDH, which has been um, indexed, and then using um, uh, Genealogy Quebec to get into the original records and, and see the original records firsthand. And, and once you get a little bit better reading the cursive, you can see that you know, he, was, he was born in La Rochelle. She was also born in La Rochelle. And you get to see that you'll read the names. When you get into baptism records, you'll have the names of the godparents as well. Okay, so that takes me back to my ninth great grandparents. So remember, Daniel was a founding, uh, one of the founders of New France. So I'm gonna Google him. Uh, and then we're gonna take a look and see if I can find a family association. Uh, they were all founders of New France, so some, of them do have family associations like the Hamill family and the Perone family association. And then I'm gonna show you a little bit very quickly on uh, Cyprian Tangway's dictionary. Okay, so when I go into Google and I don't trust anything I pick up in Google anymore. So I, I verify these on multiple sites and I also verified this by getting into the family, um, uh, family association for Perone families of America. So by that, I know his parents. I know that his name was, uh, uh, that his mother and his father were not married. By the way, he also used Swear as a deep name. Francois ran a shipping company and he wanted to send uh, Daniel over to Quebec to oversee business in the new world. And he sent them there in 1662 aboard the French frigate, the White Eagle. We know now his, uh, Daniel's grandparents, and we know that's my 10th great grandparents. And we now have my 11th great grandparents, Jahan Perron and Marie Pinot. And we know that they were born about 1557. We also know that Daniel's religious affiliation was he was a Huguenot. So he had to renounce Calvinism in order to marry in Quebec. And when he did that, his father disowned him. And he said, I hope you have a big Catholic family and you're not going to have any of the millions out of the Perone shipping industry. So you're on your own effective now. And he completely took him out of the, out of the business, out of the will, out of everything. So I Googled on the uh, family association and I found my eighth cousin, Guy Perone, is managing the Association of Perone Families of America. And I'll show you their website if it will come up. And it, there we go. Okay. So notice this did not translate. And it didn't translate because it's in a bizarre font that is not readable by, um, by Google Chrome. But don't let that, don't let that uh, upset you because if you click on one of them, you will go in and you will see that it does translate. So you get to see more about the family. Now, I, I have corresponded with Guy and Guy has led expeditions over to La Rochelle and they have uh, in, in placed uh, monuments and plaques to Daniel Perron and what he did uh, as a, as a um, uh, pioneer in New France. We'll go back. Okay, so that shows you 
the, the uh, family associations. So this, this is word for word right off Ancestry. You can read this at your own uh, uh, when you feel like it. But uh, Cyprian Tangwe, he just went through and he, from 1608 to 1890, in seven different volumes that are all searchable in the PDF documents that, that uh, the library has. You can get information about baptisms, marriages, burials, places, dates. Um, it's, it's supposed to be one of the most comprehensive resources for French Canadian genealogy. Now, um, the, the PDF versions are at the library. They're very bulky. Some of them are over 400 megs. So, uh, so they're very, very bulky. Um, but uh, Eileen has a link to all seven volumes that if you wanted to, you'd be able to, to get to look at it. Now, volume one, that description of the database in English, I have given that to Eileen as a separate PDF because volume one is the, is the bulkiest. That's the largest of all the files and it was just easier to just do that. So Eileen has that at the library. So I did a search on Daniel Perron in volume one. I just opened it up. I did a, a, a search. I hit um, Control F, Daniel Perron, Swear, and I found out that Marie remarried upon his his burial, and uh, he died on he died and was buried on 22 February 1678, and according to this, she remarried on 7 January 1678. So how how could that be? Because we know. Divorce was not common at all in the 1670s. And she was never going to get married to somebody six weeks prior to her husband's death. So what's up with this? So let's go back and we'll take a look. So I went into Genealogy Quebec and I did a, a quick search on uh, Marie-Louise Gargotin and her marriage to uh, Charles Alain. They were married at the Guardian Angel Chapel. We're going to take a look at the original um, uh, record, but the uh, the person who did the transcription and built the index states at the bottom, the act is dated 1678, but it's truly an error. It is located in the 1679 register. So let's take a look at it. So this is what it looks like. And you can actually see in here, it is listed in, as 1678. And a translation is 7 January 1678. Now, the likelihood of that happening week, six weeks before he died is, is zero. So what happened here? This was the first marriage of the new year. And like anybody else, I'm going to have a tough time come January remembering to put 2021 instead of 2020. And that's what happened here with the priest. So. Priests make mistakes. It gets into the record. It may, it, it's a mistake. You have to do some digging into when you see this. And this is just a, 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 a capture of the, of the entire page. The entire page does show that this is the first marriage. So that was the first marriage that this priest did, and he made a mistake. So I'm going to check the PRDH again to see if uh, Charles and Louise had any children. And they did. And um, she died at roughly four months of age. Her daughter, they had a daughter, Marie, and it tells you here when she was born, which parish, and when she died, and where she was buried, and which parish. Okay, so wrapping up, um, family lore can be a great starting point, but but take it with a grain of salt. Um, be very careful what you see on the uh, on the internet. You have to trust it, but verify it. I was telling Eileen the other day that on my Lithuanian side, there's a gentleman out there who, in his tree, is convinced that my grandmother was married to my great grandfather. So his his daughter was is just not going to happen. So you have to be very careful about what you see online. Um, there are name changes because a lot of folks didn't have a grasp of French up in uh, upstate New York. Um, look, all, look at U.S. sources before you go into the Canadian sources. You can't just jump into Canadian sources and start, start looking into, into whether or not you are a, um, uh, a, a direct descendant. You have to use U.S. sources before you get into the Canadian sources. The PRDH and Genealogy Quebec are just fantastic online resources. 
Um, and again, don't be intimidated by the French language. Uh, you'll see in the, um, in the appendix uh, and you'll see on the uh, uh, Family Search website, there's great resources out there for, for translation and there's also online translators. Um, and I can demonstrate the online Google translator for you as well. Uh, so, and Google will find societies, but trust, it, but verify it. It took me all the way back to 1577. So, um, and introduced me to my eighth cousin. And let me see, that's the last one, the appendix. I think there's probably 10 or 12 slides back here that list the websites, the books, family societies. Um, and it, uh, Eileen has it as, a, as an appendix on the History Room website as well. Okay, so I think we did about 45 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. So if there's any questions, if, um, actually, let me, let me demonstrate, um, I'm going to, I'm going to get out of here and I'm just going to demonstrate the online translator for you. So here's the Google Translator. That's not, that didn't work out. So this is the Google Translator. And it's, it's easy. You can pick any language you want. You can set it up to detect the language if you want to. But I, I, just, I just type in um, February. And it comes right up. So it's it's very very helpful you want to know what the, the 27th of february is well i should probably spell 27 out there you go it does it all right there for you so it's it's really a very handy tool to have i used this when i was putting together my um my appendix for you Again, I use Chrome. So when you use Chrome, uh, you can set it up to automatically detect the language and translate for you. Uh, it's very helpful with Eastern European websites. Uh, but again, with the PRDH and um, uh, Genealogy Quebec, you can select those websites to translate for you as well. Okay, so that's that's the end of my presentation, uh, subject to any questions you may have.